Madam President, at the conclusion of my remarks, uh, I want to now ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak to up to 10 minutes apiece. Without objection. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, uh, I come and have come to the floor many times to speak out about uh, the Castro regime's abuses of the Cuban people. And today I come to the floor once again, this time in strong opposition to any attempt in this chamber to pass any bill that in any way lifts or lessens the travel ban on Cuba. I want to make it absolutely clear that I will oppose and filibuster, if I need to, any effort to ease regulations that stand to enrich a regime that denies its own people basic human rights. Madam President, I, I don't want to obstruct the business of this chamber, but I know my colleagues on both sides of the aisle are well aware of how deeply I feel about freeing the people of Cuba from the repressive regime under which they have suffered for too long. The fact is, is that big corporate interests behind this misguided attempt to weaken the travel ban could not care less whether the Cuban people are free or not. They care only about opening a new market, increasing their bottom line. This is about the color of money, not the desire for freedom. The very fact that a travel bill has moved through the House Agriculture Committee makes one wonder why American agricultural interests would even care about tourist travel to Cuba. One can only assume that it's about generating increased tourism dollars for the Castro regime to buy more agricultural products. That would only serve to enrich the regime and do absolutely nothing to bring democracy to the island. Let's be clear. Those who believe that increasing travel will magically breed democracy in Cuba are simply dead wrong. For years, the world has been traveling to Cuba, and nothing has changed. Millions of tourists from democratic nations have visited Havana, and the Castro regime has not loosened its iron grip on its people. It has not ended its repressive policies. It has not stopped imprisoning and brutally abusing pro-democracy forces. Now, sometimes I wonder, those who lament our dependence on foreign oil because it enriches regimes in terrorist states like Iran should not have a double standard when it comes to enriching a brutal dictatorship like Cuba right here in our own backyard. <coughs> How coincidental that suddenly, now that Congress is considering lifting a travel ban, the Castro regime is hoping the world will believe that it will release 52 prisoners of conscience. Well, let's set the record straight. Many people are wrongly under the impression, wrongly, reading and watching media reports that 52 political prisoners have already, already been released and are free in Cuba. The fact is, only about seven have been released and forcibly, forcibly deported from their country. Another human rights violation. Instead of allowing them to stay and peacefully advocate for change within their own country. So even when the regime releases people whose simple crime was trying to peacefully create change in their country and get imprisoned, for years for that peaceful act, then when they are released, they are released only with the understanding that they will be deported out of their country so they can no longer be advocates, peaceful advocates for civil society and democratic change. Imagine if those of us who are Americans could be arrested simply because we disagreed with the government sought to peacefully change it 
and then ultimately, after being arrested for years, were deported to some other country in the world. The remaining 47 prisoners are set to be released, but not now, not tomorrow, not next week, not even next month. But sometime during the next three to four months, we are told, or so the regime says. According to reports in the Miami Herald, nine of those prisoners have said they will refuse to leave for Spain if released. And many who were uh, released and forcibly deported to Madrid have vowed to continue their activism in exile. They have told reporters they feel the shock of being forced to leave their country. Omar Rodriguez Saludes told the reporter he feels, quote, like I was still in prison. I left behind part of my family. I still feel like I have the cuffs on my hand. The release men said conditions in the prison were horrendous. They shared their cells with rats. Diseases infested the prison. They said, and they told of inmates trying to kill themselves or do themselves bodily harm because of the squalid prison conditions they were forced to endure. Remember, these are political prisoners, not people who created common crimes. Julian Cesar Galvez, one of the dissidents, told reporters, and I quote, the hygiene and health conditions in prisons in Cuba are not terrible. They're worse than terrible. We had to live with rats and cockroaches and excrements, and it's not a lie. Galvez, a 66-year-old journalist who was sentenced to 15 years simply because of what he sought to write, 15 years of his life in these horrible pr prisons said there are outbreaks of dengue fever and tuberculosis. He said there were more than 1,500 prisoners in the prison in Via Clara, 40 prisoners to a cell measuring 32 square feet. Another prisoner, Norman Hernandez, said, quote, the prisoners are tired of demanding their rights. They lose all hope. They lose their desire to live. And they try to hurt themselves so they will get attended to. Now, these men were lucky to be released, but they will not give up. They will tell their stories, and they'll continue to fight for freedom for all Cubans. But Madam President, I ask the question, it took the regime one night in March to arrest these 52 people. One night scooped up 52 people who were peacefully advocating for change in their own country. So we might ask themselves, if it took you one night to arrest 52 political prisoners. Why will it take four months to release all of them? It's not a coincidence that during the next three or four months, there will be members of the Congress uh, who will be looking to provide the Castro regime with billions of dollars of added tourism revenue. It's not a coincidence that in September the European Union will once again deliberate the wisdom of its remaining sanctions. The nagging question that lingers in my mind is, will the 47 ever see the light of day, or will they be forcibly deported from their country and another 52 arrested overnight to take their place? It's possible the regime will never release them because they don't want the world to see them because of the torture they have been subjected to. Here's one of those prisoners. Last month, a man named Ariel Siegler was released from a Cuban prison on the ver uh, uh, verge of uh, death. Let me have that back a minute. Now, he was a 250-pound amateur boxer. You see him there in great health. This is the picture of his release. 100-pound paraplegic, 100-pound paraplegic. He did nothing to deserve those set of consequences. Last month, the regime once again refused to let the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture visit the island. 
which in my own view speaks volumes about the conditions of the thousands of Cubans who have been imprisoned. When you oppose the Castro regime, you are called dangerous. And there is a charge of dangerousness. Thousands of Cubans have been sent to Castro's prisons because of dangerousness. That dangerousness is simply opposing the regime in seeking change in your home country and for other trumped up political charges. Now, if that is what's happening to the 200 internationally recognized and known political prisoners, then how much worse must it be for the thousands of anonymous political prisoners who have not been reported because they fall under the charge of dangerousness? According to the State Department, quote, the total number of detainees is unknown because the government does not disclose such information and keeps its prisons off limits to human rights organizations and international human rights monitors. According again to the State Department, and I quote, one human rights organization lists more than 200 political prisoners currently detained in Cuba, in addition to as many as 5,000 people sentenced for dangerousness. Yet in the face of this repression, some members want to provide the Castro regime with its number one source of income, tourism. Madam President, this isn't about travel. This is about rewarding a repressive regime. We already have hundreds of thousands of Americans who travel to Cuba for family, educational, or humanitarian reasons under our existing law. But tourism to Cuba is a natural resource akin to providing refined petroleum products to a country like Iran. It's reported that 2.5 million tourists visit Cuba each year, 1.5 million from North America, a million Canadians, more than 170,000 from England, more than 400,000 from Spain and Italy, Germany and France combined, all bringing in nearly $2 billion in revenue to the Castro regime. And yet nothing, nothing has changed in Cuba except the amount of the tourism dollars the regime has at its disposal. And what does it do with nearly $2 billion of resources from tourism? Does it put more food on the plates of Cuban families? Does it create a better quality of life for the Cuban people? No. Even with all of that money coming in, the Castro regime still rations people's food. You have to stand on a line with a coupon to get access to a simple meal, waiting in long lines for a subsistence meal. Of course, when you ration people and they're online just trying to get the meal for the day, there's no time for promoting democracy or human rights. You are trying to just exist. You're trying to keep your family fed. There is no time but to stand in line, despite several billions of dollars to the Castro regime from tourism. To me, that's an irreversible concession to a regime that this week arrested a Cuban-American for providing laser printers and ink cartridges to a rural woman's opposition movement in Santiago. He was interrogated, the head of the movement's home raided by a dozen state security agents, the printer, and the cartridges confiscated. What a threat. A bunch of printers and ink cartridges. What a threat. He was subsequently released and put on a plane back. Meanwhile, an American remains in prison for helping the island's Jewish community connect to the internet. After six months in jail, this individual still faces no trial and no charges. A United States citizen jailed simply because he was trying to help the Jewish community in Havana be able to access the internet. What a crime. What a crime. And yet, 
For the most part, we're relatively silent. They were looking to help the Cuban people, but the regime doesn't want anyone engaging with the Cuban people. They want tourists to provide only one thing, hard currency, dollars, money. Now, visiting the beaches of Varadero and sipping a Cuba Libre, which is an oxymoron, provides money to continue repression, but it won't let the Cuban people si sip the sweetness of freedom. It won't change the plight of the women in white. These are women who are the mothers, daughters, sisters, wives of those many political prisoners in Castro's jails who each week, normally on Sunday, march dressed in white in peaceful protests with a gladiola and simply in doing so are ultimately trying to say free my relative and this is the consequence of what they face this is the consequence of what they face state security dressed up as civilians ultimately as you can see, assaulting them, hurting them, arresting them. It won't change their fate of the women's in white, and it won't change the fate of their family who remains jail. It won't change the fate of being imprisoned by the regime and then be released as they have done so many times when there is some international spotlight on an individual only to be rearrested over and over and over again. It won't change the tragic fate of Orlando Zapata Tamayo, who was deemed a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International, who died in February after being on a hunger strike in a Cuban prison for 85 days protesting horrific prison conditions. It won't end the desire for freedom or change conditions in Cuba for men like Guillermo Fariñas, who began his hunger strife after the death of Zapata, ending it after he heard of the prisoner release, but vowing that he and other courageous Cubans would join together in yet another hunger strike if the 52 other political prisoners are not released and put back in their homes by November 7th. This is what he has been emaciated to in his hunger strike. Lifting the travel ban, allowing tourist dollars to flow to the regime will not end any of it. It will not free the people of Cuba. It will not change the fate of the women in white or the desire for freedom of Guillermo Fariñas and so many other political prisoners. It will only enrich the regime. Now, reports this week have pointed out the economic impact opening travel to Cuba will cause to the Gulf states like Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and our other democratic neighbors in the Caribbean. The dollars that will be transferred from those tourism economies should be for the benefit of a democratic government in a free Cuba, not to bail out a brutal regime. The Castros don't deserve it, and the U.S. Gulf states and our Caribbean friends can't afford it. According to the Jamaica Daily Gleaner, and I quote, the results of various studies of the likely impact on the Caribbean of lifting of the U.S. travel bans suggest that Cuba's tourism arrival would surge to full capacity at the expense of other Caribbean destinations. Apart from Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, the most heavily dependent Caribbean destinations on the United States and the most vulnerable to the legislation to lift the travel pass uh, ultimately include uh, many of the islands in the Caribbean who would have an enormous economic damage to them. It seems to me, Madam President, we should be promoting tourism to the beaches along the Gulf Coast, not to the apartheid beaches of Castro's Cuba. You know, you're not even allowed as a Cuban citizen to go to the beaches, many of the beaches of your, only, of your own homeland because they are reserved 
for tourists. You can't enter some of the hotels unless a tourist in your own country brings you in. That's why we call it apartheid. You cannot have access in your own homeland. Imagine a, in my home state of New Jersey, we love the New Jersey shore. Imagine me as a New Jersey and not being able to go to any of the beaches in New Jersey because the government wants to restrict me from interacting with tourists and that those beaches would be reserved only for foreign tourists in my own home state, in my own home country. That is what goes on. Allowing the regime to benefit from increased tourism will not change a thing in Cuba. It will not bring democracy to Cuba. It will not make conditions for the Cuban people pay any better or change the history of the brutality of the Castro regime, a brutality that continues to this day. And sometimes I think some of my colleagues just don't have a sense. This is not using the word brutality for the sake of it. I mean, I, I think the pictures tell a thousand words. But I would like my friends uh, here in the Senate and others beyond who may not really have fully engaged in understanding what this brutality is all about to recall the words of Armando Valladares, who wrote the prize-winning book Against All Hope. He was imprisoned in the infamous Isla de Pinos in 1960 for his opposition to communism. He lived through the hell of Castro's jail, suffering violence, forced labor, and solitary confinement. His writings were smuggled out of Cuba, read throughout the world, and he was finally released after intense international pressure 22 years after he was taken prisoner. They had to rehabilitate him because they didn't want him released and shown to the world in the circumstances that some of these prisoners are. Here are some of his memories of captivity at the hands of the Castro brothers. These are his words. Quote, I recall two sergeants, Porfirio and Matanzas, plunging their bayonets into Ernesto Diaz Madruga's body. Boitel, one of the political prisoners, denied water after more than 50 days on a hunger strike because Castro wanted him dead. Clara, Boitel's poor mother, beaten by Lieutenant Abad in a political police station just because she wanted to find out where her son was buried. Officers threatened family members if they cried at a funeral. I remember Estevita and Pirri dying in blackout cells, the victims of biological experimentation. So many others murdered in the forced labor fields, quarries, and camps. A legion of specters, naked, crippled, hobbling, and crawling through my mind, and the hundreds of men mutilated, mutilated in the horrifying searches. Eduardo Capote's fingers chopped off by a machete. Concentration camps, tortures, women beaten. And in the midst of that apocalyptic vision of the most dreadful and horrifying moments in my life, in the midst of the gray, ashy dust and the orgy of beatings and blood, prisoners beaten to the ground, a man emerged. The skeletal figure of a man wasted by hunger with white hair, blazing blue eyes, and a heart overflowing with love, raising his arms to the invisible heaven and pleading for mercy for his executioners. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And a burst of machine gun fire ripping through his chest. I hope my colleagues remember these are the realities of Castro's prisons. These realities, these memories of Armando Valladares and others before we think about rewarding the Castro regime in any way. Their sins are too great, and this is not a thing of the past. Their brutality and repression have been going on since the inception and still go on today. It has never stopped. It has never gotten better. It has never changed, and it never will for so long as the regime is in power. When I hear my colleagues come to the floor and talk about lifting the travel ban, I'm compelled to ask, why is there such a obvious double standard when it comes to Cuba? Why are the gulags of Cuba so different 
than the gulags of other places in the world? Why are we willing to tighten sanctions against some, but loosen them when it comes to an equally repressive regime in Cuba, in effect rewarding them? When it comes to Cuba, why are we so willing to throw up our hands and say it's time to forget? Well, Madam President, I don't believe it's time to forget. We can never forget those who have suffered and died at the hands of dictators wherever, and certainly not in Cuba as well. It is clear the repression in Cuba continues unabated, notwithstanding the embargo, notwithstanding calls by those who want us to ease travel restrictions, ease sanctions, notwithstanding the fact that you have millions of visitors from other places in the world bringing billions of dollars, and still the repression goes on. In good conscience, I cannot do that uh, and will not step back. I've come to this floor in the past to oppose uh, any attempt in order to do that, uh, to pass any bill that uh, in essence lifts the travel ban on Cuba, uh, and I will continue to do so. I will continue to do so until we have the opportunity to make sure that the Cuban people are ultimately free, make sure that they have the basic fundamental rights that you and I enjoy here in this great country, and to ensure that all of those who languish in Castro's jails, for which the world seems to be deaf to, cannot hear their cries, does not seem to care, does not speak about, does not do anything about, uh, will continue to raise their voices in this chamber and beyond. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor.